Welcome to this rapid revision video looking at helping the wounded, the evacuation chain. I've also seen this referred to as the evacuation route and so I imagine either is acceptable. Let's get into it. This diagram shows the full complexity of the evacuation chain. Quite difficult to get your head around, so we're going to try and simplify things a little bit. The British Army on the Western Front developed a surprisingly sophisticated and efficient process for dealing with the wounded, step by step. So here's a more understandable diagram. Its priorities were, in order, 1. To save lives. 2. To return soldiers to duty as soon as possible. And 3. If 2 wasn't possible, to heal them as well as possible and discharge them from the army. Stage 1 involves troops fighting at the front. So here's the first stage of our diagram. Fighting in World War I was deadly and wounds were varied. In short, they included GSWs or gunshot wounds, shrapnel wounds, gas, cuts and stabs, which we also call lacerations, blast, and not forgetting, illness and disease. I've got separate videos on these things. Have a look at those first if you're unfamiliar. Typically, a soldier's comrades would do their best to assist them until more permanent help arrived. However, during an attack such as the Battle of the Somme in 1916, soldiers were strictly forbidden to stop and help the wounded, instead being told to wait for the stretcher bearers. Which brings us on to our next point, the stretcher bearers. So let's add them onto the inverted triangle now. You'll notice that the diagram is getting narrower, showing that actually that re refers to smaller and smaller groups of wounded and soldiers who were involved. Once a wounded man was down, it fell to the stretcher bearers to rescue them, assuming that he could not move back himself. Stretcher bearers would rarely be deliberately targeted by either side in World War I and often help wounded soldiers of the enemy too. However, the dangers were great. Long-range bullets, machine guns and artillery were indiscriminate in who they hit. Stretcher bearers would often have to cross rough and muddy terrain and travel through cramped and often crowded trenches. This meant that many wounded men bled to death on the way to the dressing station. A crucial invention was the Thomas splint, more on that another time, which helped stabilise patients with broken legs. Stretcher bearers were sometimes conscientious objectors who had wanted to help but had refused to fight for moral reasons. They rarely had medical knowledge, instead being used simply to transport the wounded to those who knew how to treat them. And that would often be done at our next stage of the evacuation route. The Regimental Aid Post, or RAP. Let's add that to the, the diagram now. The Regimental Aid Post, or RAP, was usually within 200 metres of the front line, in communications trenches or deserted uh, buildings, the regimental medical officer was in charge, with some help from the stretcher bearers who may have had a limited medical knowledge, sometimes gained from experience. Wounded men either walked there themselves or were carried in by comrades or stretcher bearers if they were unable to do so. The RAP could only deal with minor wounds, and they tried to return as many men as possible back to the front line if they'd patched them up. But it couldn't do with the deal with the seriously wounded, who would need to be evacuated to the next stage of the chain, the dressing station. The dressing station and field ambulance will be dealt with together here, and bear in mind that field ambulance in this case does not necessarily refer to a vehicle. In ideal cases, there was an advanced dressing station, or ADS, about 400 metres from the RAP, the regimental aid post, and the main dressing station about half a mile far further back. But in the chaos of war, this was often only just one dressing station to deal with everything. Again, ideally, dressing stations were in bunkers or abandoned buildings to offer protection from artillery, but sometimes only tents were available. Wounded men arrived on foot or carried there by the stretcher bearers. The photograph shows a more well-constructed dressing station. Here is what it looks like today. This is Essex Farm dressing station outside Ypres, which became famous as the venue at which John McRae wrote the In Flanders Fields poem. Anyway, I digress. The dressing station was staffed by 10 medical officers, otherwise known as MOs, and medical orderlies and stretcher bearers of the Royal Army Medical Corps, or the RAMC. And from 1915, occasionally, there would be nurses at these two. So to continue with that, let's have a look at the field dressing station and the ambulance too. Those workers working at the dressing station belonged to a unit of the RAMC called the Field Ambulance. This wasn't a vehicle, it was a term for the whole organisation. The vehicles were called ambulance wagons. Here's an example of a motorised ambulance wagon, although horse-drawn ones were also common. 
In theory, 150 men could be treated by a field ambulance, but many more were usually treated during major battles. Who's dressing station near Ypres dealt with over 1,000 wounded between the 10th and 11th of August 1917 during the Third Battle of Ypres. The dressing station and field ambulance was intended to stabilise the condition of the patients so that they, they could be transferred to better medical facilities by horse or motor ambulance. They didn't have the facilities to care for men any longer than at most a week. More lightly wounded men would be returned to the front line where possible. Here's an account by someone who worked at the field ambulance and for the field dressing stations. This is from the diary of ESB Hamilton, who wrote this on the 19th of August 1916. Hamilton had been in France for over a year at this time as part of the field ambulance. At the time of his diary entry, he was working at an advanced dressing station on the Somme. The dugout of the ADS was awfully overcrowded both night and day, and it was impossible to get it cleaned or aired. There were something like 800 people through here in about 30 hours the day before yesterday. This is far too much work for the personnel of three officers and about 115 men. The result is a lot of men are done up and the other officers seedy and depressed. Clearly, there are a lot of pressures working in an advanced dressing station. For more permanent care, though, we had the casualty clearing stations. I say permanent care, I more mean in the sense of stabilising their conditions. Casualty clearing stations were located at a sufficient distance from the front line to provide some safety from enemy fire, but close enough to be easily accessible by the ambulance wagons. Often the CCS nearest the front would try to help the most critically wounded, such as those with head or chest wounds. These would be based upon in abandoned factories, schools and other buildings. The CCS was often by a railway line in order to allow the next stage of the evacuation to happen quickly. Here's a photograph of some tents at a casualty clearing station. What about that big symbol then? What's that about? Well, the fact is, by this point, aerial warfare is becoming more prominent. And so these needed to mark themselves out as hospitals so that enemy bombers would not bomb them by mistake. However, we do have powerful evidence today of the failure of some casualty clearing stations to, to ha help every man. And that was hardly surprising given the, the severity of many of the wounds that they were dealing with. Here we see an image of Liesenturk Military Cemetery. Every single one of these gravestones was somebody who arrived at the casualty clearing station who they tried to save, but who they were unable to save. Source B is from Ward Muir, Observations of an Orderly, published in 1917. Muir was a lance corporal in the Royal Army Medical Corps and worked in a hospital in London at the end of the chain of evacuation. We orderlies meet each convoy at the front door of the hospital. The walking cases are the first to arrive. Many are either not, uh, not ill enough or not badly wounded enough to need to be put on stretchers in ambulances. They come from the station in motor cars supplied by the London Ambulance Column. The few minutes which the walking case spends in the receiving hall are occupied in drinking a cup of cocoa and in having his particulars taken. Poor soul. He is very weary of giving his particulars. He has had to give them half a dozen times at least, particularly perhaps more since he left the front. Uh, particulars in this case would be their individual details. At the front, at the field dressing station, they want, wanted his particulars at the clearing station, on the train, on the steamer, on the next train, and now at this English hospital. On arrival, the wounded would be divided into three groups in a triage system. This helped medical staff make more efficient decisions as to who needed the most urgent treatment. The categories were the walking wounded. These men could usually be patched up and returned to the fight. Those in need of hospital treatment. These men would need to go to a base hospital once they've been treated for any immediately life-threatening injuries and their condition stabilised. And then there were those with no chance of recovery. Tragically, those with no hope of pulling through were made as comfortable as possible and left to die, so that scarce medical resources could be dedicated to those with a chance of survival. Here are some statistics relating to the casualty clearing station at the Third Battle of Ypres, or Passchendaele, in 1917. There were 24 casualty clearing stations in Ypres salient. 379 doctors and 502 nurses staffed the CCS. More than 200,000 casualties were treated. 30% of men were admitted were to the CCS required surgery. And 3.7% of the men admitted died. Which, when you think about it, is actually a pretty good survival rate, showing that despite the conditions, they did wonderful things in casualty clearing stations to keep men alive. The last stage of the route were the base hospitals. 
Base hospitals were usually many miles from the danger of the front lines, close to the French and Belgian coast where men could be transported back to Britain. Originally, the base hospitals were intended to fulfil the role of actually being done by the casualty clearing stations in practice. Instead, the base hospitals found that many patients arrived already operated on. As a result, base hospitals developed new and improved treatments for the sorts of wounds that emerged in World War I or specialised in specific wound types. Major offensives resulted in increased capacity. In 1917, three new hospitals with 2,500 beds were set up. Men would be transported by rail and sea on hospital trains and steamships. Once a soldier's treatment was complete, there were typically two options. Number one, they would be passed fit for duty. Soldiers who were fully recovered would be passed fit for duty and they'd be returned to their unit. Or they might be sent to Britain. Soldiers who treat, whose treatment needed to continue would be sent back to British hospitals. And from there, they might be discharged. This meant that the soldier would be discharged not only from the hospital, but from the army too, his duty done. This was typically because their wounds were too severe, for example, when a limb had been amputated. So this covers the physical wounds. We will have to study the mental trauma separately. Our final points then. This diagram, if you could perhaps draw it out and memorise it, will help you to remember the order of the evacuation chain. The evacuation chain was surprisingly effective at saving lives and returning men to duty, or helping them recover if this was not possible. The first stage, troops fighting at the front would do their best to leave the wounded somewhere accessible. Stretcher bearers bravely risked enemy fire to get men away from the fighting. The regimental aid post did what it could to stabilise patients. The field ambulance and dressing stations stabilised them enough to be moved to more advanced facilities if needed. Casualty clearing stations performed more complex surgery, gradually taking over some of the functions of the last stage of the chain, the base hospitals, that provided the most advanced care and long-term accommodation for the wounded. At any point of the chain, soldiers who could be returned to duty were. This not only saved lives, but it helped stop the army running out of men. And that concludes this rapid revision video looking at the evacuation chain in the First World War and how the wounded were both taken away from the front lines and helped, either helped into civilian life or helped back to the front line to fight. Or in a tragically large number of cases, they were helped as far as they could before they died. Thanks for watching. I hope that's been useful to you. If it has, please like the video and subscribe to the channel for more. But for now, I'll say thanks very much and goodbye.